Well, first of all, they'd need that software on their computer to do it. And secondly, um, they may or may not get the gist as completely as they could from a diagram. So diagrams, and definitely, um, if you were sending to a client, you wouldn't think they necessarily would have Visual Studio on their machine to open up and run your code to see your prototype. So plain HTML um, or even a mock-up. Even if you did ASPX pages, then it would be beneficial like, to take a screenshot of them and send them as opposed to giving someone that. Again, because you never know the, the skill level of, of the, the user that you want, might be sending this to to communicate. So you do it to communicate. Um, I prefer when people design that they don't design in the tool that they're going to use because a lot of times they get caught up in the tool and lose the thought process. Then it becomes like, well, how do I make a two-part key in access? And you shouldn't be worried about that when you're designing. The whole idea of designing is that you're putting something out there to get feedback on. Um, another thing that when you do, to keep in mind when you design is you, you do need a little bit of a thick skin because um, sometimes the requirements given to you are not real clear. People want an application that does something or they want web pages that do, that, that do something and it might not always be 100% uh, clear. Well, you take a shot at it. You put it down on paper. Now, Maybe you get it right, maybe you get it wrong. And if you get it wrong, they may say, oh, this is nothing near what I want. You know, I need this and this and this. Don't take that personally. It's part of the process to get you to where you need to be and to get to an understanding of the requirements of the site and, and so on. So it's funny, when, I, when I've done websites and I've prepared prototypes for people, um, I have... Uh, I have to tell them, like, you don't need to be nice to me on this, <laughs> all right? You can tell, if it's bad, tell me it's bad, you know, because then I'll get the answer I need to do the job, you know? In a way, it's like, like they say, putting up a straw man, you know, you put up something for them to rip apart, and by doing that, you find out ultimately what they do want. So, those are my thoughts. Take a look at my comments um, about your design, and if you need clarification, let me know, all right? Um, okay. Yeah, go ahead. So with um, designs, <coughs> is there, um, I know it's probably just the um, client's preference, but is there like a standard to send the actual files, like Notepad and JPEG? Do um, you just send it in? or Like with the Visio? Right. Do I send you the Visio file, or do I make a JPEG of the file? Well, well, that is an excellent question because a lot of times um, I'm, I'm grading on a Mac. And can you view Visio on a Mac? I don't know. Every time I get one of those files, it takes me 20 minutes to go out and research it and so on. So what I did is I just I, I graded everyone that didn't send me a Visio file. <laughs> then when I came in here, I graded it in one of the labs. Oh, I would stick to the standard formats. I would consider Word a standard format. I would consider a rich text file a standard format. I would consider a JPEG a standard format. I would consider a PDF a standard format. So I would stick to the standard formats that I would I would expect. You know, think of it if you were sending it to a non-technical friend. Mm -hmm. What would you expect a non-technical friend to have? Because yeah, and a JPEG would would work or whatever. Yes. I tried installing Visio, believe it or not, but. Due to Access having 32-bit components, I installed the 64-bit version of Access, and then I tried installing the 64-bit of Visio. Well, Visio didn't like that. It said, oh, there's a 32-bit component on here of Access. I won't install. And then I tried to install the 32-bit, which also said, oh, there's 64-bit components on here. I won't install. So it's a paradox. It's like... So you want to install for either? You know, um, that's where I think, and, and this is my opinion, all right? You might get other people saying other opinions. What I look for in a design is the ideas, not the tool. So if you were to hand sketch an ERD, as long as it was legible, and scan it, well, take a picture.
picture with your iPhone or whatever, all right, um, that would be acceptable if I could get the ideas from it as opposed to a beautiful diagram that, yeah, I, I can't open for one, or if I do open it, I'm looking at it I'm like, what are they trying to say? Sure you but it looks nice, yeah. It's like, I'm going to blow this up and hang it on my wall. It looks so good, you know. But, again, the focus for design is, is to, to convey the attitudes to communicate. I'm just, I'm just saying Visio is stupid. That was the point. Duly noted. I'm sorry, but a program that won't explain... I won't install the 32-bit or the 64-bit because there are conflicts with both. It's a tough life, isn't it? <laughs> Do something else then. For that, that, that's exactly what I would say. It's like, don't spend your time wrestling with problems like that. Sketch it out by hand. You know, you have better things to do than wrestle with issues like that. All right, on to updating. We talked last time about the update statement, and what we're going to do is we're going to start off by using the framework to do the updates. Now, you can kind of imagine in advance how this is going to go, right? Because when we talked about queries, um, we talked about there being a data a data object, a set of data objects, or a data object, a data source, I guess is the best way to put it. Then there were visual components. So we had a SQL data source, and then we had a grid view, or a details view. And the SQL data source says how we got our data to populate the grid view. So you can imagine there's going to be two things that we need to do when we actually get into wanting to be able to update. Um, a piece of information, um, a, a row in our database. And that is we're going to have to make changes to the data side, and we're going to have to make changes to the visual side, too. All right? And we'll, what we're going to do is we're going to evolve from, like, the simplest, most straightforward case to more complicated cases. So we're going to do just the, like, bare minimum, all right, of being able to do an update, and then we'll expand that to do more involved things. At some point, I will take and I will write, I like custom code this, kind of like I did with the queries, where I don't use the frameworks stuff, I am going to custom code it. And why am I going to do that? Well, sometimes it is a smarter thing to do, right? And if you know how to do both, then you can look at a situation and say, yeah, it's better to take this approach or it's better to take that approach. Uh, again, when you have uh, a problem that doesn't neatly fit into the framework, your options are to either figure out a way to jam it into the framework, force it in, all right, or figure out a way to do it yourself. And either way can be the right decision. Um, that's why it's good to, to, to be able to, to do both. Right? I just realized the first 15 minutes of this lecture is, is a blank screen with me talking. It's like the Wizard of Oz. I should have I drew like a big picture, you know, uh, of, of a mouth. It would have been great if we could animate the mouth, too. But anyhow, that's, that's a little elaborate. All right. So I'm going to go into player info. Are most of our um, SQL commands, is that done through the um, Visual Studio? Or, like, is um, access pretty much just to store information, but we're not going to really mess around with the that's correct. or the queries or anything? That's, that's like that? correct, yeah. You, you could do some things on the access side if you wanted to. For example, you could write a query in access, and then you could use it within Visual Studio as though it were a table. Mm -hmm. All right. That's called a view. Uh, they actually call it something else in Access. They call it queries in Access. Yeah. But um, you can actually, uh, in other databases, you can do that as well. And in most other databases, that's called a view. So if I had some very complicated join to join like six tables together, I might write a view for that. And then I could use that view on my page 
um, instead of recreating that complicated six joins. Uh, the problem is, is normally that would be something that would be like read-only because it's combining from several different tables. But yeah, mo the work is happening in Visual Studio. Um, you can use access to verify and to troubleshoot and things like that, but the work is typically going to be um, there. All right, let's refresh our memory as to what this guy does. We have code in here, remember, that if you're not logged on and you try to access this page, you bounce to the login page. So player info is finding out that I'm not logged in, and it sends me to the default. That's a great advantage of having, like, snails paste computers, all right? On a fast machine, that would have happened like that, and you wouldn't have noticed it, all right? But here you can actually see it redirecting. <laughs> Or you could actually almost, if you listen real hard, you could you could hear the server say, "Wait a minute, this person isn't logged in. I better send them to the login page." All right. So I log in, and then I get my information. Now, what if I want to be able to change any of this? All right. Let's go and and do that. All right. So what we're going to do is we're going to make this editable. All right. Again, this is going to require changes made both to the visual component and to the data source. So let's look at this. If I look at the properties here of the visual. Oh, backup operations. I don't see anything yet that says you can edit this, edit the data in this. This is allowing you to edit the, the details view, but not allowing you to edit that. The reason is, is because the details view is smart enough to know that all I have is a select and I don't have an update. All right. So it knows that I can't possibly update this data because I haven't supplied the SQL to update it. So what I'm going to do is, oh good, we have, we have the names of the fields here. I'm going to go and write an update statement. Update player set. Am I going to change the player ID? No. That's the primary key. It's a generated number, and so it's not going to be editable. But I might be able to change the first name. Set first name equal to what? Well, we don't know. All right? Whatever is in, so we put a question mark. Exactly. That is a comma. I could just see, like you taking a test from NORAD or Huffman, and you don't know the value of one of the questions, <laughs> so you put a question mark there, and you'll say, well, Zeller said anytime you don't know the value of something, put a question mark, and you'll be right. So why did you take off points? change everyone's first name to Mike every time you ran this. Okay. All right. Which, <laughs> yeah, which, yeah, no, no, I mean, I understand that you're asking a syntax-related question, not a, not a, um, a practical one. Um, but, um, yeah, the question mark, well, the question mark represents that the data is going to be coming from the details view. All right. Um, There's no comma. What else do we need on this? Uh, aware. 
We need a where clause. And why do we need a where clause? To, spec to specify. Yeah, to specify which row. In other words, if I go and I change a player's information, I don't want to change every player to that information. I just want to change the one. How do you guarantee that you're only changing the one? By using the primary key in the where clause. So I will say where... equals question mark. All right. Now this is a little different than with, with updates, inserts, and deletes, it's a little different. We don't need to specify where these fields are come from, are going to come from, because it assumes it's coming from the columns in the details view. All right. We've already populated those columns in the details view when we've done the retrieve. So it assumes that the first name we want is the value of the first name column. Now, right now, that first name's a label, so we can't possibly change it. But we're going to change it. We're going to change the, the details view to allow editing of that field. So I can go through next, next, finish. You forgot a semicolon. Uh, I'm pretty sure I did have a semicolon. We'll, we'll, we'll see if it burns me. Um, this is a message that you get if you um, change something about the details view. It's probably safer to, add, to answer yes to this. The potential downside is, is if you've customized that grid view, you might have to, or details view, you might have to redo it. So I'm going to say yes because I haven't really done any customization here. All right. So now when I click on this guy, notice I have enable editing, all right? Because now it knows that I could potentially want to enable editing, all right? Um, and therefore, I'll click that. Now, why didn't it automatically enable editing for me as soon as it saw the update statement? Maybe. Just in case, like, you can, like, manually go in and edit, and it's not, you know, like, unknowingly set the table to be editable. Okay. You can just, like, man just manually say, yeah, and then will edit it. Yeah. The other thing is we could programmatically set that, enable editing. So, for example, I might have two screens, or, or not two screens, uh, I might have a page that would allow some people to edit it and allow other people just to view it. All right. For example, announcements uh, in Canvas. Everyone can see the announcements I post. I'm the only one that can change them. All right. So if this if that was done in ASP.NET, all right, I would have the update statement ready to update an announcement, but I wouldn't necessarily enable editing of the grid view or the details view, whatever it was, and I would programmatically enable it. And I would look to see if the person's the instructor for the course. If they're an instructor, then I would enable it. Otherwise, I would leave it unenabled. So this just gives you more flexibility. All right. Again, it should not be surprising that you have um, two things to change when you do this. Because the whole thing that we've built this on is that you have a source of the data and then you have the visual UI representation of it. So we change the source of the data to allow for the updating of that data. Now we have to change the visual aspect to say, yes, we want to allow editing. And now we get this little edit button. All right. So I go in and run this.
All right, I can edit it. It starts out being in read-only mode. I can go and edit it. Notice when I hit edit, what happens? Most of the fields go from labels to text boxes, except the player ID, because that I can't change. All right, so I'll go in and I'll make, change my first name, to Michael. All right. I just got that. Pardon me? Never mind. Okay. And I'm going to click update. It's either going to work or not work. We'll see. Boy, that's confidence for you, right? <laughs> we'll see. It worked. Why did I say it might not work? Well, because I have a headache today and I might not have clicked the right thing. Well, besides that, notice that when we set up this update, all right, when we set up the update, um, we didn't specify some things. We didn't specify, like, how the fields get populated from the, the, the details view. We assumed that the details view would take care of it. We also assume that the details view would know like what the key was to that table, the, 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 the player ID. Depending on the kind of SQL statements you have, sometimes it gets confused. All right? And sometimes it doesn't work. Therefore, what we're going to do now is we're going to look at the actual code that got generated uh, and to see... Um, some of the things that could potentially go wrong. I will say this, if you're updating or deleting, you're better off, updating, inserting, or deleting, you're better off having a select statement that only uses one table. All right, so avoid joins. Not saying you can't do that, but it generally works better. Well, what do you do then if you want to uh, um, display values from another table? Well, we'll talk about that. All right, we'll talk about that um, in a few minutes. So let's look at the actual code that got generated. in 
the update statement. I'm sure before the end of the semester we'll have a case where there's update parameters that we can look at it, but that's sort of a heads up. Now, the framework allows us to edit this, right? And we can go and edit it. But we might look at a couple things that we don't really like about this. Namely, one of them being Imagine this is me logging in. When I log in, it shows it to me in read-only view, and then I have to click edit. I kind of don't like that. All right? I kind of wish it just put me in edit mode to begin with. That's like an extra step. All right? Assuming that you can only view your own player information, which is the case that we've made so far, right? because we're pulling it from the session ID. That's sort of an unnecessary step. I guess it prevents you from accidentally editing something, but, well, I'm not sure if that's much of a game. So how do we fix that? Well, again, in an object-oriented world, and when you're using a framework in an object-oriented world, the question of how to do something is usually, what are the attributes that control that? So if I look at, that details view, I will scroll down and I will see somewhere here, oh, by the way, data key name, that's another thing that could go wrong. It might not have the name of the field that is the primary key. All right. I did just such a basic example that it would almost be hard for SQL to get this one wrong. So it put in the, the player ID, but sometimes if you have more than one table, blah, 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 it can get confused. That's why I stick to one table typically. Default mode defaults to read only. I'm going to change it to default to edit. All right. So now when I log on and go to this page, it automatically puts me in edit mode. change it so that name is a required field. So I'll we'll click on required. It still won't let me change. Let me... Is that enabled content? Uh, that's a good question. But I do. Thank you. Oh, 
close this. Visual Studio. I get rid of my name and click update. Box. Boom. Oh. Not like, a nice, not like a nice little box or anything. Yeah. I get an error. And it's an ugly error. All right. Um, this error actually is fairly descriptive. You must enter a value in the. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. Um, other times you will not get as descriptive errors, or you will not get errors that a user would necessarily be able to, to decipher. And this is confusing because you really don't know what you could do to fix it. I mean, would someone be aware that all they need to do is press the back button and fill in a name? I don't know. Maybe they would, maybe they wouldn't. At any rate, we don't want to show errors like this. All right? We don't. So, what can we do to prevent errors like this? All right. Put an if statement. Yes, you can, but there's components that already do validation for you that you don't need to write your own if statement for. All right. So I could simply put a required field validator on the page and be done with it. All right. So effectively, yeah, we're going to validate it, but we're not manually going to write an if statement. We're going to write the code to create a validator control. Then we could do other checks as well, right? For example, if there was an age field here that had to be numeric, we could test to make sure, we could put a validator to make sure that the age was numeric, for example. If there was a date, we could make sure that the field was a legal date, and so on. So, we could put validation controls on here. Now, we can validate for a lot of stuff, all right? However, there may be some stuff that we can't validate for, all right? For example, what if the database crashed? What if there was some constraint in the database that we weren't able to accommodate for, all right? What if we had a delete and there were related rows that prevented the deletion? There's some, there's some things when you deal with databases that are outside of your hands as a developer, all right? You're asking the database to do something and the database is going to do it and it's either going to succeed or not. It may give you an error. But that's not something you've coded. 
So the bottom line is, no matter how airtight we make our validation, we run the risk of getting ugly air messages like this. All right? And therefore, we want to handle the errors ourselves. So we're going to take a two-pronged approach to preventing ugly errors like this. Prong number one is to write validation code wherever we can. Also associated with prong number one are doing things like putting a drop-down in instead of a text field, if that's appropriate. So, for example, if I had a foreign key to a Teams table, I would not allow you to type in the name or ID of a team. I would have a drop-down that you would select the team that you belong to. All right? Or if I had a skill level, I would not have that a free-form field of, of you know, um, beginner, uh, intermediate, or expert. I would have a table that contained those three values, and then I would create a drop down or radio buttons or something and limit to that. A table in access? A table in the database, exactly. Exactly. There's a, a, lot, of, a lot of times in, in databases you'll see like little code tables that their only purpose is to provide a list of values. All right? The nice thing about building them in a table is you can always add that add to that list. So for example, if I had a uh, list of teams that you could choose from, if I added a new team, I add it to the table, it's on the drop down then. Or if I added a skill level, if I said, okay, we have, um, you know, um, beginner, intermediate, expert, world champion on the top. And right? that table, that table um, team, and I guess skill, well, team will be the primary key, and then the actual names of the teams will be the data that we enter into the table. Exactly, exactly. Uh, we'll, we're going to do this in a minute, but what okay. we'd have is we'd have a team table, let's say, that would have a team ID and the team name. We would then add to the player table a foreign key to the team ID, mm -hmm. okay. and then we would go and allow them to change the team ID in the player table, but we wouldn't want them just to type it in, because you might type in a team number that doesn't exist, or you might not know that... All of our values will be the team. Exactly. Okay. All right. Exactly. And the table would just be populated with those two fields. Exactly. Okay. Exactly. Now, sometimes there could be additional fields, too. Mm -hmm. Like, if there was a coach associated yeah. with the team, or um, their team colors, or whatever. Um, then you could have extra fields as well, but at the very least you'd have an ID and a description. Like for um, a skill level. If we build a table for skill level, it would probably just have the, the key to the skill level, the primary key, a skill ID, and then a description that said beginner, intermediate, expert, world champion. All right. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to validate. And then we are going to write code um, to handle errors better. Now, one thing about this particular error message, we're seeing the text of this error message because we're in developer's mode. We're running off of our local host. So it knows that we're the developer that's writing this, believe it or not, based on this. All right. This is probably not a good message to give to an end user. First of all, it's a little hard to understand. All right? Player, F name, what does that mean? <laughs> Secondly, another problem with this. What's another problem with this? Yeah, I was going to say, well, the other problem with this message, right, is there's no clear thing that you have to do. If the user's clever, they'll hit the back button, but many users this would kind of throw them. The other reason this is a bad message is this gives a potential security threat some information about your internal database, all right, that you have a table named player, and that table has a column called F name. So because of this, when you put your file up 
on a server and someone is accessing it through the internet and not you as a developer, you'll get an even less descriptive error message. They'll just say like, unhandle exception, whatever, you know. Um, but you won't see a detailed error message because this actually is giving information for people who potentially could try to hack your system. Yes? Is there a way we can see this page as if it was someone seeing it? Like an user? That is a good question. I'm going to do a quick look. Why does this bring me to Bing? Oh, because I'm using Internet Explorer. Okay, <laughs> never mind. Bing does have nice pictures. I will say that. But if I want nice pictures, I'll go to the art museum. Um, One thing you could do, probably the best way to handle it, is you could modify your This is, the, this is the error that you would get. This is what the user would see if I didn't do anything in my web config file and they got an error. So that's what they would see. No mention of the table or anything like that. Just a very generic. I'm hitting the back button on this browser. <laughs> I was like, yeah. <laughs> However, we can actually do better than that. We can specify our own error message page. So if they got an error, we could, we could uh, direct them to uh, a page that we could give them a good message saying, you know, call Don Huffman and give his phone number or whatever <laughs> if there was a problem. So the first step is, without doing anything, we get that sort of generic. The other thing we could do is we could write our own error pages. The other, other thing we could do is we could handle the error ourselves and not let the .NET framework handle it. And we'll see an example of that as well. All right, on to adding a validation control to this page. So I go to my little old toolbox here. And I go and I say validation. Let's make the name a required field. So I go and drag my required field validator over. This is not going to work. All right. Why not? I'm going to go and I'm going to say, what field do I want to validate? Oh, control to validate. There's nothing there. All right. Well, that, that's not very useful. All right. Why do you suppose there's nothing there? It's a little tricky. There's many fields. And Too many know. fields. We didn't choose which field. Right, but it's not even allowing us to choose which field. Kind of. The problem is this. Remember back when we first did this. When we first did this, we went into read-only mode. And were there text boxes on the page when we were in read-only mode? No. There were labels there. All right. When we're in edit mode, there's text boxes there. 
However, even though we set the default to edit mode, those text boxes are not necessarily always going to be there. We could, through our code, put them back into read-only mode. So we can't write a validator for a control that's only sometimes there, all right, in a nutshell. That text box is there some of the time. There are other modes where that text box is not there. So we cannot write validation for it. Well, that kind of stinks. What do we do? Well, fortunately, this is a case of where we want to do something that's different than the default framework behavior, but it's not that hard to do. So we can tweak the framework a little bit to allow us to do what we want to do. Remember, whenever you're confronted with something where the framework doesn't do exactly what you want it to do, you have choices. One of our choices would be to not use the built-in controls and to write our own text boxes and all that kind of stuff. All right? And we could do that. In this case, however, it's easy enough for us to tweak the detail view. All right? And the way that we allow data be, to be entered in a different way than the default is via what are called template columns. All right? I don't like the, the name of those because it doesn't really make sense to me, but what the heck, it's just a name, right? What we can do is, again, the default. The default for fields to be entered is a plain text box with no validation on it. Well, gee, that's pretty boring, right? And it's not going to work for some fields, all right? Because A, I might need to validate those fields. B, I might not want to use a text box. I want to use a drop down or radio buttons or a check box, all right? However, we can go in and convert a column to a template column, and then we can fiddle around and change it to allow the entry not to be in a text box or to add validation to it or whatever. So, this didn't work. So I'm getting rid of it. I'm going to go into mode and I'm going to say edit fields. First name. This it says into a template field. What does that mean? It means we're going off road. All right. We're not doing. We're not following the defaults. We are customizing the way this works. We are then able to, and I think this is where the name template comes in. We are then able to override the defaults for the display of a field. The editing of a field, the insertion of a field, and so on. So when I click this to say convert this field into a template field, okay, it changed a little icon. All right. Right now it looks exactly the same because we've, we've just said that we are going to customize it. We haven't actually customized it yet. How do you customize it? By going into edit templates. And Here's all the different things that we can change for that field. Item template is how it looks in read-only mode. And it's a plain old label. That's fine, right? I mean, that's okay uh, that, our, that our name is displayed in a label. That's all we need. Alternating item template. This would be more relevant if we had um, a grid view maybe. But this will allow us like to like make it so that the rows are different colors going across and, and things like that to make it easier to read. That one we don't really care about. The two that we're going to care about are edit item and insert item. Because what we're going to say there is, hey look, I want to customize the way this guy gets edited. Now, it 
kind of stinks, but we are going to have to do the same thing if we wanted to use this page to insert into. Because the insert and edit item templates are two different templates. Again, don't ask me why, because normally the way that you would insert it would be the same rules for editing it. But this gives you the flexibility to do both ways. All right. So I'm going to go and I'm going to drag the required field into the edit template, edit item template for this column. So now notice the position of that required field validator. It's not outside of the details view, it's inside that template. So now I can go and say, what's the control to validate? Oh, that text box there. And I can put in the error message I want. size or do however I want. Now when I go to run this, If I go in and try to not put a name in there and click update, I get an error. Jesus. <laughs> but we've seen this error before, right? This is the error that usually causes me to go on a half hour rant about how <laughs> this is a problem with the version of uh, they changed the default for something and changing the default way of doing something is a bad idea. Um, if you add a new feature, your app should work the way it used to unless you explicitly go and choose to use the new feature as opposed to defaulting to the new feature. So, anyone have any idea what day I did that? You know what? I'm just going to Google it. Right. Exactly. Yeah. That, that's a clear one. I need to take the default. I'm using a blah, 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 blah. I'm attempt to add in. If this key value is set to none, default, the ASP app will use the pre blah, blah, blah behavior.
now the validation control kicked in and it says must enter name. And I don't get the big old ugly error message. Can you go back one more time and just show us? To show which part? The very last part, what did you just change in order to... What I changed? Uh, I, I changed the web config file. And like, do, does everybody have to do this? Or yes. Or define a different way of handling errors. Oh, uh, okay. Yeah. But using that method, you have to do this. Using, using the plain, simple, basic method, you have to put this gotcha. line of code in in your web config file. App settings, add key, validation settings, unobtrusive validation mode, value none. I don't know why I didn't just remember that off the top of my head. <laughs> Come on. So you can download the example from today and just copy and paste that into yours. Okay, so the template column can be used for a couple things. In, in general terms, the template column is when you want your you want you want the fields to behave differently than the default. And we know what the default is. Label for read only. I'll just talk about the most relevant ones. Label for read only, text box for unvalidated text box for edit unvalidated text box for insert. So if you want to deviate from that, you have to make it a template column. And when you make it a template column, then you can go in and edit the template. And you can edit the template to be um, something other than a, uh, um, a text box. For example, a drop down or a radio buttons. Or you can edit it to add validation. Yes? Is there a way to have the error message done underneath the text box? Looks kind of like Where do you want it? Like just outside, like underneath the text, like here to the right of the table or something. It's not actually like under the text box. Um. Yeah. Because even if the error message isn't there, it's, it still has a room. Oh yeah, it's still room. Yeah. Oh yeah. I, I mean, if it just didn't show that space, that'd be fine too. And then it showed the space right there. That one's an easy answer. The other one's also an easy answer. If I wasn't lazy. <laughs> the easy answer to of not showing that space visible. is no, not visible. Ah, display. Static. Static means it's always going to take up that space. If I say dynamic, then it will take up the space if it's needed, otherwise it won't. The other thing I would do, of course, is I would style that differently through my CSS, and I could I could make it. That's the part I'm too lazy to, to go into yes. right now. Right? But I could make the error message red, I could uh, make it a different font, italics, and I could make that table wider. Again, even though I'm too lazy to do it, I'm not too lazy to show you how you would do it. All right. So if I go and run this, now, I could 
say table with 50%. One other comment I would have while I think about it, about design. For those of you who sent, turned in a ASPX prototype, I don't recall seeing master pages for some of them. You probably want to have master pages. Oh, and it's, it's still, again, this is a case where the CSS code that I write is going to be fighting the CSS code that it generates. Yeah, there's a style built into it with the Well, now even though I'm lazy, I'm irritated that it's not allowing me to, to do that. Let's see. And template editing. Get rid of the width. problem of it doing style for you is that sometimes the style that you want to create interferes with the style that it creates. I uh, like that. bet you if I gave a width to the TD that would that would make it always bigger. But again uh, yeah, you guys can manage that. All right. Um, next time, what we're going to do is we're going to look at two things with this. We're going to look at, first of all, um, what if I want something other than a text box there? Like if I add a team. So we'll go into either the team or the skill level. And we'll create a drop down for that or a radio button. So what if I want to do that instead of a text box? That's another reason that we would use a template column. So we'll get that straightened out. Then we'll work on what about unanticipated errors? How do we handle them without displaying ugly messages? All right, we'll see you over in lab.